start. But I think um, all of our teachers at every grade level is differentiating for our students' needs. And so we are, um, we're doing that throughout, you know, E12. Um, that's part of what we have to do. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different tools that we have and there's a lot of different um, skills. And we also are counting on our partnership with our families. You are the first um, teacher. You are the first um, person that knows intimately with your child about your child. And so that is part of what we do, especially in kindergarten. Um, let's really hope that we are not in COVID. And part of what we do intentionally when we start off in kindergarten is that we do home visits and um, do partnership. And even when we were in COVID, we do a home visit through Zoom and we meet with our families and um, are getting to know our families. And we say that intentionally by families because it's not just about getting to know the student. Um, we want to really know our families and do that well so that we can find out those little nuances of how to really um, find out how to best work with your, um, with your student, with your child. And so that is helping us to um, find out what brings out the spark of your student and how to better push and accelerate and um, um, better educate um, your student. But yes, there is a continuum of every student, but certainly, um, we do recognize that this year, um, probably more than other years, um, there's gonna be um, larger um, spreads in kindergarten. And so we're, we're, we recognize what that, um, that that will be and we're gearing up to make sure that we are gonna be able to meet those needs. So I don't know specifically, um, Shelly, I- yeah. um, One more thing I wanted to spring up with that question and I know um, is that, for academic areas, particularly looking at literacy and math, we have a second adult in the room. So all of our sites across the whole district have a paraprofessional that's in the room or instructional assistant that's in the room. And we help utilize that for small group instruction. So you might be thinking about a classroom and thinking about a teacher standing in front and teaching to a whole group of kids. And that would be a super challenging experience to have this gap and trying to teach to a, a full group of kids like that. But we don't teach kindergarten that way. We teach in small group instruction. There's very short segments taught whole group. A concept might be taught where every child needs to know a certain concept. And then we go into small groups where we can, where we can meet individual needs and having that second adult for both literacy and math really helps support that small group instruction. And that second adult is also there during recess, during lunch, during those social emotional times too. So that's also something that's unique to kindergarten as well. Each of our school, uh, schools, um, as Shelly and Carrie just indicated, we each have a four hour para educator that are, that's in each classroom. So um, working right alongside of the teacher and also going out there with um, the students for lunch and recess. Other questions? And right. I, know we have I have another one, if, if, unless someone else has one. So I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> so I suppose it's a two part, but um, what, uh, um, how are grades handled as the child progresses from K to, you know, throughout? And then um, are there any um, philosophies or, or uh, I guess, yeah, around like how, how like how, discipline happens in the classroom and how that's handled? I can start and my colleagues can join in. Um, so at the elementary schools um, and all three sites are the, the, um, the same, we have been, um, it's been an evolution this year uh, due to the pandemic and due to not being able to meet families face-to-face -face, um, in a safe. So we've been meeting virtually um, family connect times and we are, um, we don't have grades or letter grades in elementary schools. Um, we feel that there's a continuum of growth and how, where does the student start and where is the student ending at the end of the school year? Uh, knowing that um, there's summer and different things. So we are, um, in a process in the next couple of years to be looking at how do we best 
look at mastery of skills and concepts and how do we report that uh, in a way that is family friendly and also useful to families and what they want to know and need to know for their child. So um, we are all working together to um, have a better plan for our families. We used to use a, a grading scale of ESPN um, and we're trying to move away from that because there's a lot more cons to that then there are pros. Um, so we're working on that. Regarding your second question, discipline, um, at all three of our sites, all four of our sites, I don't mean to leave Park Spanish Immersion out, all four of our sites and all four principals, head principals, um, are working with restorative practices. We do a lot of circles um, instead of, and what if you're not um, aware or what this process is, I'll say in the old days or just a few years ago, you know, a student um, and another student have a conflict, whether it's verbal or physical, you know, we look at a grid and uh, we look at a timeout, we look at a dismissal. If it's really serious, we look at a suspension. We don't do that anymore. We look at how can we take that moment and have a circle um, discussion with the students at their developmental level. So they understand how that made me feel if I was the person or how it made the other person feel. And yes, it takes more time, but let me tell you, it is so powerful and there's so many positives behind um, explaining in a format of that. Uh, we're communicating with families all the time. Um, so definitely a restorative practice district and we're getting better and better at it. Other colleagues wanna? You, you hit them. I mean, you hit the restorative practices. That was what I would speak to. Um, and just to uh, give a little bit more info or background information about restorative practices and circles that um, Clarence was speaking about. Um, it is a Native American practice that um, we are, um, bringing into our buildings to be able to help create community and help students uh, communicate. Um, for me, um, a lot of my time in high school and uh, my time in elementary now um, is that's been a, a, and I don't wanna reduce it to a tool because I think it has a lot more, um, it has a lot more uh, ramifications or you know, depth than just it being this tool that we use to, you know, get kids to be able to talk to each other. But um, I, it's definitely something that um, is very beneficial for our students because they learn a lot of skills, um, learn a lot of, well, how do, I, how do we talk to each other when things go one way or the other? Um, and not only that, we don't wanna just use it when it's you know, a hard time, we wanna use it when it's positive things too. Um, so it really is a communication <laughs> style. Um, it is a kind of, a, a, it, it, I don't, I don't want to get too uh, far one side or not, but it is kind of like this spiritualish type, type thing where you tap into just something different and, and use your skills and your abilities to, to, to communicate and talk with each other and, and solve problems or celebrate or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, it's just a little bit, of, a little bit more about restorative practice. Thank you. Yes. It's one of our pieces around building culture and climate, along with like responsive classroom. So yes, thank you. It is seven o'clock. So uh, Clarence, I know. Yeah, no, if um, we can take a few more minutes, if you want to stay with us, please do. Or if you would like to attend one of the session, one of the other sessions, please feel free to leave and join one of them. Again, by us saying that, we just wanna keep on schedule, but by all means, if you wanna stay uh, more time with us, we'd love to have you stay as well. So just wanted to let people know um, you can do that at this time. And the other sessions are, there's one on IB, International Baccalaureate. So sometimes people ask what makes Peter Hobart, Aquila, Susan Lingren different than either Park Spanish Immersion or any other school that you might be choosing. Um, and so IB tends to be the one thing that is um, quite a bit different um, or different in general. 
Um, and then the other is the student panel. We, I mean, who doesn't want to see amazing students? And then um, the other one is the PTO, so the parents. Um, and then I don't know if there's teachers. Oh, of course, the kindergarten teachers. Yes. You know. And there's childcare. Yeah. There. Okay. Yeah. Those are the other That's options. Mm -hmm. Other questions coming up. I think we had a couple of new people join us. Welcome. And for those of you that are just new joining us, this is kind of a question and answer. It's your time. So we will fill it if you think of, if you don't ask any questions, but certainly if something is coming up, we wanna make sure we address that first. So don't be shy. You can either speak it out um, to us just on mute, or you can go ahead and use the chat. Either way, we'll, we'll, we'll monitor both. I'll try to jump in because I'm getting close to bedtime. I can feel it coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, and I'm sure there's a lot of other things that are more pressing to worry about with COVID, but not being able to do kind of the standard kickoff nights in person in March, do you know if there will be any attempt to do something like that in late summer, maybe, or... Hmm. Just thinking about trying to get the kiddo kind of introduced to the building a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. I, you know, I think we're monitoring that all the time. And as soon as we think that we can bring people back, we're going to do that. Um, I know that what we did in the fall this past year is that we had, we had an event where people had signed up time where they would come and we had tents outside. And so, nope, it wasn't the exact experience that it would have been if we could have been in the school. But as, as this, progresses and hopefully more people are vaccinated and, and this disease goes down, um, we're going to be able to get back to a more normalcy, which means we'll get, we'll get kids into the building. I will be honest with you and tell you that if we get into summer and don't believe that that will happen, then we will have to be creative and that will be our job to be creative, to figure out ways for how do you experience and see the inside, particularly as families. Because one of the hard things that's been for our kids right now is our kids are back in our buildings right now but the parents aren't. So for some parents, they've never had that experience of saying, hey, I've never walked down the halls and, and I don't know what that's like. So um, that's on our radar. Just know that um, we realize that this experience isn't just for your child, it's also for you. We want you to know what your child is gonna feel, what they're gonna see. Mm -hmm. I do love the idea of us being creative. And I do think that um, many times our kids are the ones that teach us how to do that. And, um, you know, for example, I know the high school did it and then we tried to do it at Peter Hobart yet and we're still fine tuning it, but whether it's, um, you know, virtual reality or um, drone tours through the building, um, but trying to get like a, whether it's a bird's eye view, but a kindergarten eye view of what it is to walk through the building. Um, and so similar to what Shelly said, so if our kids get to do it, how do we make sure that our families are getting that same kind of experience? So um, I'm hopeful we'll get there that we, don't have to be as creative, but if we do, I believe we can. And looks like in the chat, Shelly, there's questions about um, yes. like on Facebook. Yes. You know, we're trying our best. And I think the thing in this, I know it was for Aquila, but um, yes, we're still raising money for different pieces of, um, and, it, and I won't speak so much for what different things it's going for, but at least for us, um, PTO does most of um, the fundraising, actually 100% of the fundraising. Um, at least in our buildings, and I believe that's across all of the elementaries. But part of the exciting part for at least the different buildings is that along with fundraising comes all of the spirit and all of the um, excitement around it. Um, so that's at least been in most of the buildings um, that I'm aware of. But Shelly, I can let you. No, I just, yeah, I wore my pajamas on Monday. That was a big hit. Kids really liked it. I did Buffalo plaid because this was the big year for that. So I had a lot of people matching me. Um, <laughs> What we did this year, we're, we're, all of our schools are in the middle of doing fundraisers right now. I, I believe all three of our schools are at least. And I think our immersion school went is close to this timeline. But every year we do, we do a big kickoff and it usually is in the fall for all of our sites. Mm -hmm. And the money goes right back into what we do in our classrooms. Often it's been for field trips. It's been for things above and beyond, things that we would normally do as a school. The added incentive that I think has created a lot of stir <laughs> this year at Aquila is that we allowed kids and staff to create a wish list because we're in the middle of this pandemic and we said, what would bring you joy? Like, what do you really want to do? Well, they want a Gaga pit. They want, they want these instruments, these certain instruments in, in the music room, along with some drums. 
They want certain things in the media center, like a 3D printer. And so right now, this incentive is that if you raise, oh, at a big speaker outside, because we dance it out on Fridays, leaving the school. So they've got these items. And if we raise a certain amount, that's, a, that's an automatic buy. They're going to get that. And I will tell you, the kids are like super excited about it. So it might be the way that we are going to look at fundraising in the future. And as much as um, the kids are competitive, I will also just say that between the three principals, actually all four of us, we're pretty competitive. Yeah. Um, I do draw a line of, that I will not wear like shark footy pajamas and sleep in a tent outside like um, Sister Polly. <laughs> I, I draw my line there. So sorry, I'm, I'm all in, but <laughs> wear footy shark pajamas and sleep in a tent outside at Susan Lingren. Mm. I, I haven't gone there yet. I yeah. Maybe maybe the price just wasn't high enough, Principal. <laughs> maybe maybe or pie, or pie in your face. Yeah. I know yeah. I I I yeah. I got to do that my first year. <laughs> Dunk take. Nope, haven't done that, Chris. Maybe that's you, but I, you know all the things. So yes, but good question. Good question. Oh, what doesn't seem to be IB? on tonight? I, I see know. a question in the chat here about I'm um, joining the IB breakout and I do oh. know that is then so I want to send a note to Matt to make sure he checks the link right now in our um, where, where you're getting all of your links going back to that folder because I if I would like you to be able to go and hear that so I'll send him a message right now mm -hmm. and if we can we should put it on this chat here because I know Anne she and was, Olivia yeah and they're ones that are like as much as I can sit here and tell jokes all day long, they've got a PowerPoint and they're real serious about it. <laughs> all right. Other questions that are coming up. So for Jessica in the chat, um, I don't know about the applications being mailed. I know that you can actually get applications on our website. So if you go to the district website, they have it there. I don't believe that the actual ones were mailed out, but I, I could be wrong about that. Other questions, wonderings coming up for anyone? Maybe specific to a school or to any of our schools? Yeah, hi, I have a question. Please. Um, my name's yeah, hi, uh, my name's Travis. Uh, we have our, our um, oldest son starting kindergarten this year. Um, and we've been, you know, teaching him various things at home and math and that kind of thing. And so if he's not at the same level as kind of what's normal, whether that's ahead or behind, how is that, uh, handled? Is it kind of a, sorry, I joined late, so I'm sorry if you already addressed any of this, I don't know. um, but is it kind of, Try to stick to the small groups in terms of okay like maybe this group is a little bit ahead so they get this stuff or is it more on an individual basis where okay this person's at this level so we'll try to get some worksheets or content or something for them how does that work that's a great question travis um uh we in our elementary classrooms at all three sites all four sites um really um focus on small group instruction as much as we possibly can. I know that <clears throat> Principal Nielsen last session talked about sometimes there's large group, um, like very short uh, lessons um, that they have everyone like sitting on the carpet, but those are very short because kindergarten students, their, um, their um, attention span developmentally may not be able to withstand you know, long periods of time, and that's very normal. So the teacher does do exactly what you were um, talking about, Travis. They um, look at the students' abilities and they also challenge each other. So um, meaning the students in the groups um, appropriately. So there's a lot of small group instruction. Um, also for anyone that joined this session at all four of our sites, we have a four hour paraeducator in each of our kindergarten classrooms. So there are two adults for a good portion of the day. Um, I know that Shelly, Carrie, Corey and I and Chris all, when we build our schedules, we try to have those 
paraeducators in there for the most of the curriculum time. Um, they also help at recess and lunch. So there's definitely um, having those two adults is a huge benefit for the learners in any of our sites. We are also excited. Um, well, just today we had an announcement. We are really working at um, trying to do um, think, think outside of the box and what can our students benefit from no matter who they are, uh, no matter if they're black, brown and indigenous, white students, we all have sparks, we all have an excitement and we're trying a new program that we're just hit, kicking off um, starting next year, talent development. And it'll be at every grade level um, uh, that will be a pullout program um, similar to FIAD, similar to music and media. And it will really um, be able to excite students in a number of different ways. So I'm super excited about it. So that's one more unique way that St. Louis Park Schools are um, looking at uh, helping the students out in any way we can. There's a question in the chat. Is homework fairly light for kindergartners? Yes. Um, and at many of our sites, um, there may not even be homework because there are times within the school day and the small group instruction that they're um, spending almost one-on-one -on -one or like I said, could be four students to one teacher uh, working on those skills that that group of students really needs to hone in on. So yes, uh, very light, if any. Other questions? Um, I can talk a little bit, maybe this will um, spark questions. Um, like I said a few minutes ago, um, we call it specials um, at our sites. What we mean by that is um, we are lucky enough in St. Louis Park to have PE or gym, FIED, um, every day uh, for a half hour. So kindergarten through fifth grade students will go to FIED every day. Uh, this year uh, is a little unique because of the pandemic. We've had to be really creative with our schedule, but uh, I think all of us are hoping that we'll be able to go back to five days a week, hopefully. Uh, they will also have music twice a week for a half hour a piece, half hour sessions. They will have media. And then like I just briefly talked about, um, they will have talent development up to four days a week for a half hour. And I did put the IB link in the chat if you want to grab it and just put it into your browser that will bring you into IB if you want to if you wanted to go and be able to at least catch that last session before they they won't they'll, they'll start that in about five minutes. Uh, question in the chat, is there a standardized way that sensitive historical topics um, like Thanksgiving are taught in schools? Um, I will say, I'll try to answer this one as best as I can. I think that, I, I won't say that there's a standardized way, but we have, um, within our district, uh, we utilize uh, those courageous conversations about race protocol. Um, which kind of standardizes how we look at topics like Thanksgiving or other historical pieces. Um, so it's not necessarily that there's curriculum specifically around, it's how our teachers are trained to kind of look at those things to be able to you know, bring an accurate picture and offer multiple perspectives um, to the historical events. I'll also add that, um, you know, I think one of the good or bad things to it, depending on where we stand, and I, I believe our mission has definitely driven that, um, you know, we are very much around um, enhancing the spirit and IB being an IB school, we are a global community. And so, um, you know, 
Halloween is not global. That is, um, you know, very much a U.S. thing, um, similar with Thanksgiving. And so when we are um, not even asked, we are an IB um, school and schools are three IB schools. We need to be in that mindset. And that is what we are um, tasked to do is create um, and educate in a global, um, create global citizenship. So that really gives us permission, but responsibility to do so. Um, and so it aligns with our mission of our district. And so with that in mind, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. Do we teach about that along with the idea of what else is there? So it's not that we're ignoring Thanksgiving. It's the idea of being sure that we are having the multiple perspectives to it. Um, so it is the idea of um, we don't have, um, you know, I can speak for Peter Hobart um, that we don't have Halloween parties where everybody is dressing up in Halloween costumes. And I can say that across all of our elementaries. Um, and so does that sometimes feel like, oh, are we the fun sucking principles that has taken the fun out of Halloween? No, I'm not gonna go knocking on the doors of everybody and did my own kids trick or treat through the neighborhood. Yes, we did, but that is not going to happen here um, in our schools. Um, but do we talk about that? I'm sure um, we do. And we'll talk about the other cultures and other um, traditions that happen in other cultures. So that is part of what is um, what an IB and part of what our mission of our district is about as well. So um, but that is what is we're asked and um, what's important about what we do. But I don't want to lose sight of something that, that um, Chris mentioned, Chris, and I appreciate you bringing this up, is that as we look at history, our job is really to help kids navigate how do they find the truth in our history? Yeah. Because we know that we have multiple sources of information that are coming at us. And our job as educators and your job as an educator for your child is not to say, I don't want you to, I only want you to listen to one source of, of information. It is how do you find information that you know is to be accurate? And we all know at this point that so much of our history isn't accurately portrayed, particularly for people that don't look like me. So for people that are not white, the history that we have portrayed in our country has often been written by people that do look like me. So I think that one of the, I appreciate Chris bringing that up, but I, I also wanna speak in as a white principal leader right now and not just let our, our colleague of color right here speak, that it is our obligation to make sure that we help educate our kids to hear those multiple, um, those multiple voices, those multiple stories and understand that history sometimes isn't always accurate in the way that it was first given to us. Mm -hmm. So I, will, I just wanna offer that piece. And that is important and impacts all of us. It impacts my two white sons if they don't hear the multiple perspectives. A Thanks. question in the chat, um, how is bully, bullying handled at the school? Um, bullying is taken very seriously. I can start out by saying that. Uh, we would also, uh, like we said in a previous session, um, we would, depending on the situation, every situation is unique, we would more than likely um, have a circle, a uh, restorative circle, in regards to seeing how we could repair uh, the situation or the relationship or the conflict at hand, um, depending on the specifics of the situation. Uh, there would always be phone calls to families um, of the students involved in regards to that. Um, and we, we take it very seriously. Bullying um, also, I wanna be careful here, bullying, the word is sometimes overused in our society. Um, and we in St. Louis Park want to stress that, unfortunately, students will make poor choices. They might call a person a name, uh, which never feels good, which is super disrespectful and hurtful, but that's not necessarily bullying. It's the repetitive behavior or the repeating of a situation. Um, so again, I, I don't wanna be on the Zoom and saying we don't look into things. We look into things, all of us, but we also keep track of if it's a pattern, um, or not. So I hopefully, hopefully that 
helped with your question. Sorry, Clarence, I'm, I'm, I kind of missed a little bit of what you said, but I just wanted to throw this piece in there too, just around like, please, please. the idea that like with restorative circles, you know, a, a lot of it is, is a, done to, to repair harm. Um, so when I think about what bullying does, you know, typically we think of like one bully and then one person that the bully is bullying. The reality of it is a lot of times like our whole classroom communities or even our school communities are could be harmed by whatever takes place. So um, I, I like the idea of, um, of us being able to communicate with our students in a way that allows them to uh, share their perspectives about what happened, um, fix and correct the the, the, the issue and um, really begin to build community in a tighter way um, to you know hopefully stop those things from happening in other ways in the future. So as I look at the clock, uh, we are approaching kind of the, not kind of, the start of our third and last session. If you wanna stay on this session, by um, all means, please stay and continue to listen to us. If you wanna to switch to one of the other sessions, uh, you can do that now. Just wanted to give everyone a chance to switch gears if they like. <coughs> and welcome to any new families uh, that have joined us. Um, we have um, been saying in the last few sessions that the four of us can fill the time for sure, but we really want this to be a time where any of you can ask us questions, either over the audio or in the chat. Uh, we've all been keeping track of questions in the chat, so um, feel free to ask either way. Well, it looks like maybe we're a small group. I could ask yeah. something. We'll just Go for keep it. the conversation. So um, the full disclosure, I'm a teacher myself, um, out of state considering a move to the area. Okay. Um, and it, so basically what I'm hoping for my kids is to be in a place where the teachers are supported in their passions because I know that happy teachers make for a happy school. So my question is around how um, teachers at, at your district are supported in their passions um, and in, in, their, in their careers and, and work life. Crickets, crickets. No, no, I was gonna say, I, I love that question. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna come at it from a couple different ways. Uh, first, I'm gonna just tell you that uh, social emotional learning is really important in our community but it's also really important for our staff. So when I even think about this past year, there has been a push for us in building um, capacity for our teachers, even to care for themselves, knowing the, the, the burden that education has on making sure that we're continuing to meet the kids, our kids' needs in a variety of modalities, going from distance to hybrid to distance to fully in-person. Um, so I first wanna tell you that it is our responsibility to help take care of our staff. And to make sure that we are that we're looking out for them. And the second thing that I think all of us do, and I think St. Louis Park offers it by being a small district, is just as our kids have all these opportunities, so do our staff. So we have after school programming. Like I can think of, like we have a play at our school that becomes a really big thing. Every school has kind of their thing that they really like that they have. But it is why we have that is because it's an offshoot of the the adults that are in that building and the passion and compassion that they have. It's their spark. So we have people that are artists and they just, you know what, I really wanna do art. And so it's what they bring to our kids in our building. Um, so, and I think that what, when you heard all of us, we all have this connection to St. Louis Park. Well, why are we still here? Why am I here? After third grade, why am I still here? I think it's because my bucket's been filled all along the way because certainly I could have been in other districts, right? We all know that. So I, I want you to know that people stay here because they're, they're filled, their lives are filled here. 
And, and that doesn't, that isn't just for our families, that's for our community, for our, our staff community as well. You'll find a lot of lifers here and you heard it tonight, just in, even in the leadership group. So that's a great question, by the way. Just to echo what Shelly just shared um, at Susan Lindgren, um, connecting to what Shelly said about different teachers or staff member sparks. Um, we have at Susan Lindgren, um, a teacher that loves to cross country ski. It's been a tradition. So she is a fifth grade teacher um, and she takes out the different uh, classrooms of fifth grade and they cover for each other. She teaches them and then they go out to Elm Creek. Uh, unfortunately, not during a pandemic, but every other year they have went out um, and cross country skied. That's just one example. Uh, the other example is we go bike riding in fifth grade down to a park in Minneapolis. Tons of families join us. Um, similar, uh, just a couple of years ago, Carrie Schreedering and I applied for a grant through Hennepin Theater Trust and we uh, got it. And we had teachers trained with actual um, actors from Hennepin Theater Trust. And um, it was through Disney as well. Unfortunately, then the pandemic came and neither one of us were able to put on our student shows, but very similar, Aquila has had a long tradition of these wonderful student plays where they can share their spark and teachers can. Um, so teachers are talking to each other. And, you know, I think um, I would echo what my colleague Shelley just, what my colleague <laughs> Shelley just said, um, that I don't know that I would be here you know, 28 years and open and roll my children if I didn't believe in this district. So just that's, I'm just one voice. I don't speak for all of them. Um, another thing that at each of our sites that we have groups of teachers that are extremely passionate and share ideas. Um, and I experienced something this year that, you know, I was like, feeling I was in the middle and there's a group of teachers like Clarence, we need to do this, we need to do this. And then I approached and it was uncomfortable, but we as a district um, talked about it. It was our DLA, our Distance Learning Academy. And um, that was driven by teachers, clearly not just at Susan Lindgren, it was at all the sites, but that was a, a moment where, you know, you're trying to hear the teachers, but also hear from families. And I think that's another example. One of the things I was gonna say is, um, and I'm surprised we didn't get it tonight, but you know, like why, why choose St. Louis Park over anywhere else is, um, you know, like what makes this unique. And one of the things, and I don't know where you are coming from or where, you know, you know, is it Hopkins, you know, next door or are you talking Vermont? I don't know. Um, California. <laughs> okay. Oh, where in California? Uh, Bay Area. Okay. Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Jamie Amazon is from out there. But anyways, um, my sister is up in Sacramento and my brother's in Palm Springs. Both, well, my brother-in-law is a teacher and my brother is a teacher. So both there is. But, um, but with that, um, I would say there's a variety of reasons. Um, but one is the innovation of St. Louis Park. And I can say that from the innovation that we've had educationally at different programs that we've done based on, you know, BAR is a program that we have created that has now gone, um, you know, across the nation, be it in California is one of the schools that we've started schools across and um, equity coaching is another one, but all of those highly innovative programs that have moved, um, you know, student achievement, um, staff satisfaction has started through teachers. So it wasn't a top-down program at any point, but it came out of teachers saying, like, I believe we can do better. And it was a group of teachers coming together saying, this is how I think we can do it differently. And I just think that there are very few districts that allow or have systems and structures in place that have that kind of um, agency or voice in that capacity. And so I think about that of like, where can you have that in really such a small district that allows that large of a voice? Um, you know, I mean, it's hard in large districts to have that kind of, you know, movement, 
but it's also hard in smaller districts like this to have that kind of capacity. And so I think there's, there's, I mean, that's a lot to be said, I think, for us to have that kind of, um, you know, belief around, we just have amazing educators who really do, and I do feel like we have a voice in what it is that we can do. And there's belief in that, so. Now, I'll throw one more piece in there too. Um, for me, like one of my passions and one of the things that fills me up is working with kids. <laughs> Uh, so I, I can't expect that to be everybody's, you know, thing that gets them through. But for me, like, I love it. <laughs> I show up, you know, and just, you know, we, we just had our kids come back all in person and it has been life-giving <laughs> um, to see their, how they interact, their faces, their joy, their, you know, all of the things that kids bring to building. So I just, I, I would throw that in there and just say that like, you know, I, I and I, I, again, I can't say this for everybody, but like, my passion is working with young people. Um, so that's, that's what helps me and that's what gets me through. And that's, you know, that's what I enjoy about working in the school. Like it's, they, they're amazing, you know, they're, they're great, they're amazing. They, they, they fill you up and, and, I would hope everybody had that same belief and thought, I know not everybody does and it's, you know, it is what it is, but um, I believe a lot of our teachers do. I believe a lot of our teachers have, you know, really high passions when working with young people. And when they get to, um, in combination with a lot of the things that were brought up before, you know, bringing in things that they personally care about or have some, some, some stake in and being able to apply those things and give those things to kids, I think that's where people really start to, you know, really enjoy and do their best for our students as well, so. Do either of you have any other questions that we could answer tonight about our schools or curriculum or programming? I hope you're not visiting Minnesota anytime soon because, oh my goodness, this is not the week to be doing it now. <laughs> did you uh did you find all the answers that you wanted tonight in the different things or anything that was missing you know that we're a 7 45 start we're an early start school we go till 2 15 each day we do have a before and after school child care program, lots of activities for kids to participate in after school. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a um, instructional assistant in each of our kindergarten rooms that is with our kids for both literacy, math, as well as lunch and recess. Sometimes a little bit more curriculum areas, but always literacy and math. Um, a lot of small group instruction you can find that when you, when you attend our schools. So I don't know if it is Elizabeth that's actually behind the pink E or not, but if you've got any other questions or, or any questions at all. All right. I'm gonna take that as a no. Well, she didn't wanna know if, if, if she could get into the PSI lottery. Jasmine, that's a good question. There's, I went on the website because there were so many questions about it. There's no application. There's no, like, what do families fill out? That it doesn't live on the website. So they have to request it from the enrollment center. And it doesn't say that. We probably need to say that. I'm gonna, cause we've had that every single night that we've been on. And tonight it was a theme that kept coming up each time. Mm. Where's the information about the immersion? How do I get that? Where's the phone number? And so then um, soon what happens is that parents just start talking to each other about it in the chat instead of like even being with us. It's all about the how to. And if you get super savvy, you can go into PSI and you can start clicking around and you can actually enroll in the kindergarten info night. 
<laughs> so did we have did we have many parents ask for it tonight? Mm -hmm. Like a good handful? Yes. Okay. The, applica the application, is that what we're talking about? Sorry, I came yep. in late. Because the, if you live, if you are open enroll, that has come and gone. That was January. Well, they can still they can still fill out an open enrollment for PSI because that deadline is like the statewide soft deadline, but there the lottery is still done February, like after February 16. So if they're open enrolling and want to try PSI, they can, but the, the odds are not going to be very great unless they're a staff member or have a sibling already at PSI. Well, it doesn't really, it doesn't read that way really well because this here, this is what one parent wrote to another parent in our chat. It appears on the PSI website that applications were mailed to the residents in January. We did not receive one. How are we going to get an application to ensure that we can get in now by February 16th? And this was a non-resident parent? This was a resident. So they have to, and and that's the thing that we need to figure out how to let them know to be get on the kindergarten list. And I've had a, you know, they'll call in, they'll come in through like early childhood screening and any of that stuff. But Matt, well, do you have any ideas of what we could do since it's due next Tuesday? Well, and I think some of them thought that, but even if you go to kindergarten enrollment, it'll have on there that says that, you know, you got, you know, a certain amount of time or whatever, but it all depends on if you are in PSI or, or like you're open enrolled or not, because it has PSI application process. When you click on the PSI application 